So good morning. Thank you for venturing out into this awful weather and even worse traffic. Um, my name is Stephanie Sanicastro. I'm the acting director of the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program here at CSIS. And again, I'd like to welcome you here. Before I go into my introductory remarks, I would like to ask you all to um, silence or set your Blackberries and, and iPhones to stun, if you don't mind. Um, it will affect the microphones up here, so I do ask you to do that. So over the past year or so, our Homeland Security um, program has been looking in depth at National Guard issues, courtesy of the Army National Guard's um, sponsorship. And we have made um, several findings and recommendations that you'll hear about later with the second panel. But before we get to that point, I would like to um, provide some outlining remarks just on the topic and then in introduce our keynote speaker. As major combat operations that have defined the last 12 years draw to an end, a wide variety of new and evolving challenges are emerging and confronting our nation's military. In addition, the budget environment is increasingly unpredictable, creating uncertainty within DOD as roles and missions that services have filled for the last 12 years shift and as cuts to personnel, equipment, and other resources loom. The Army National Guard faces a unique set of circumstances when thinking about its potential role in domestic and overseas operations. Last year, the Army National Guard asked us at CSIS to provide an independent analysis of the strategic level issues facing the Guard, as well as its evolving roles and missions. So you won't find me up here talking necessarily about numbers, but we will be talking about the, the strategic level issues facing the Guard and the active Army. Today's event marks the completion of our CSIS series on the future of the Army National Guard and is intended as a forum not only to release our final report, which you should have a copy of, but also to examine the future of the Guard from multiple points of view. To deliver the keynote remarks today, we have the honor of welcoming U.S. Congressman Tim Waltz, who is currently serving his fourth term representing Minnesota's first congressional district. Congressman Waltz is also co-chair of the National Guard and Reserve Components Caucus along with Congressman Duncan Hunter of California. Congressman Waltz is no stranger to the National Guard. He enlisted in the Army National Guard at the age of 17 and retired 24 years later as Command Sergeant Major. Before retiring, he served overseas in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, and as such, we believe he is the highest ranking enlisted soldier ever to serve in Congress. Since coming to Congress, Representative Waltz has made improving the care of our nation's veterans a top priority. He has been recognized for his work in Congress with awards from AMVETS, the National Association of, of County Veteran Service Officers, and a variety of other organizations. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Waltz. Well, thank you, Stephanie, and good morning to each of you. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be here with you, and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to it. The, the timeliness of this report uh, could not be better. Um, it is, uh, of course, with the, the appropriation season in NDAA last week and, and the discussions on uh, what the force looks like moving forward as we reposition out of, uh, out of a war stance and, and into uh, what will be uh, what will be a new posture, and I think it's of the lessons learned. Certainly you would hope so that the lessons learned will help dictate the direction that that goes. So I am, I am grateful for that, and, and thank you for the kind introduction. I'm always reminded uh, when I ask the question to people if you know the difference between a eulogy and a political introduction, the answer is that the political introduction, one person believes it. So thank you very much for that. Uh, but I, uh, in full disclosure, I, I, as you heard, I, I think approaching this issue and understanding this force structure, uh, I certainly come from, and, and I think it's important not in, to understand where, where decision makers and where folks are coming from with the experience that they have. Um, I am a product of that, that post-Vietnam National Guard, and, and quite uh, honestly, I spent most of my career 
trying to prove that I was worthy of, of the active force. And, and the fact of the matter was that was at times very, very challenging because of the structure and the nature of this. Uh, there were times in my artillery battalion where because of the lack of equipment and training funds that I was taping a howitzer cab on the floor and using toilet paper rolls as the charges to try and train that. Uh, that's certainly not the way a great nation trains for its defense. It certainly wasn't the best use of, uh, of the patriotism and the willingness of those young folks to serve. And I watched and had the honor and privilege of watching how decisions were made to integrate into that total force, to understand that the strategic depth of the National Guard wasn't just a whole bunch of guys we already had signed up in case the Russians rolled through East Germany and we would bring them in and get them going, that there was much more capacity there uh, in terms of, uh, of knowledge. We certainly have seen it in these conflicts when we saw uh, National Guard folks with uh, with experience in public planning, with experience in corrections, with experience in other areas of uh, civil engineering that were taking and, and expanding upon what their, their, their MOS or their military mission was to enhance that greater mission. And I, I think the investments that we made, and we certainly know the numbers, that at one point in time we had over 30 percent of the forces in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq were National Guard and Reserve Forces who, by all objective measures, performed admirably. And, and I think what we have to come to this conclusion, and I think it's a reality, of what does these post-conflicts look like and, and what does the as you look at the Quadrennial Defense Review, if you look at where this nation repostures to the Pacific and all those decisions that are being made on the, 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 the big strategic level, how are we going to get this right? Because to be very honest with you, this is one area we can't mistake, we can't get wrong. And so the struggle we're having and the unfortunate, and I, I want to be very clear, you can't have this discussion in the vacuum away from financial issues, away from the budgetary issues. And while it's not the simple answers that, that we always want to have, because in politics the black and white makes it easier to contrast, and that's the discussion that everyone wants to have. So it, it is not as simple as, as tanks versus teachers, but, but there is truth in that. We have priorities. We have decisions to make. So trying to get first and foremost that this discussion must be driven by what's in this nation's best strategic interest, what's in this nation's best interest defense-wise, and expanding on where the president was, there's certainly the reality that the United States is going to have to be an actor in global affairs. Now, the interesting part of it is in Congress right now, a new dynamic has emerged where the, the left, w with the assumption, and I'm certainly uh, agreeing that there are certainly major tools that we have outside of the military in the projection of U.S. soft power, economic power, diplomatic power, and all those things, but, but a left that, that, that is simply will and willing to pit tanks against teachers as if it's as simple a choice as that. And now we have the new dynamic of an isolationist right, and the two have met on the international dateline of let's just hope everything works out okay, kind of where I would say. We certainly hope and pray that we would never have to deploy forces either in defense of this nation or of allied nations, but it, it behooves us to be prepared. With that being said, it doesn't mean that there's an endless amount of money that should be done. And that brings us back to the discussion we're having right now, how to best and effectively deploy our resources, economic resources, to the defense structure that we have. And I would make the case that for us to revert back and it feels that way to me that the little chip on my shoulder grew, and, and, and I certainly respect and understand the position that, that, that military and Pentagon leaders were put in, like General Odin Yerno, but the reason on the restructuring certainly isn't because Guard and Reserve train 39 days a month or a year and, and don't get the job done. If your argument is, is that it doesn't make strategic sense or economic sense to do this, then present those numbers. And I think that's why the importance of this report that you're doing, very similar to what my, my colleague and friend Joe Wilson has asked for in the House, the brilliance of, of, of CSIS is, is that you're not going to have to wait for us to hash it out and get the Senate to get it done. We've got that report. And, and I think it's very important to help drive this discussion of what that N4 structure looks like. And, and so I, for one, very much look forward to this. I, for one, know that we have to be driven by data. We have to be driven by that proper end straight. The problem that I have is, but prior to this report and others that I hope we get is, we don't have the imperial data to make that the, the distinction. And one of the problems in this city that you find is people will know the 
price of everything and the value of nothing. And, and trying to quantify what the strategic depth and role of the National Guard is has to be made so that we can make the argument and have the discussion through civilian leadership to get that correct. So I, I can't stress enough, my goal is, is not to protect armories in every small town in America. If that's not what's good for this nation, if that's not what's good for the defense, if that's not good for the economic strength, then we need to make those hard decisions. And people who were elected to do that need to stand up and say, we might have to close an armory in small town, wherever it was. But I don't want to make that discussion based on a turf battle that reverted back to 1980s. And let's be very clear, General Ognierno, Secretary Hagel, the tags that were put in the very uncomfortable position of having to write letters that got onto that close red line of the politics that they should never be asked to cross were put into that position because people do not have the courage or the willingness because it's very easy in this town to vote no against everything and go home and say I save money. You didn't save money by voting not to invest in something, and you don't get to say investments is just another code word for spending. You, you have to have the courage. The question would be, are you spending it wisely, and are we getting a return on our dollars? And so my position that I am advocating for is, I think with the data that this report and the others that we're looking for will help inform us of that. I'm not looking to be backed up on this, that the National Guard is a better buy. I personally may think that, but that can't be the judge of the decision making that needs to go there. And the Army cannot make that decision making that, well, you only train 39 months of year. It's virtually impossible for you to be at that same level. Provide the data. Let's be driven by the data. Let's be driven what's in the best interest of this country. So the discussion you're going to have today needs to help inform us of that. And, and, and my colleagues are going to be looking for that. And, and there are still, and I don't want to make this case. There are well-meaning people, both from the position of looking for peaceful solutions, which we all are, to those who have the position that isolationism is a little smarter. I'm not advocating that we be involved in this, but we've got allies in this room. We've got national interest around the world. And certainly uh, leaving a problem for the next generation is not leadership. And so with that being said, um, the investments that we made need to be protected. This reserve force, this strategic and, and deep force that you have out there in the National Guard that does have a dual mission also, though, is a force that the American taxpayers invested a lot in. It's a force that is trained and hardened in battle, and, and we need to decide how to best use them, and it must be predicated on the data. And I want to be very clear that I I'm always conscious of that chip on my shoulder about this. I'm always conscious about proving that, that, that we are worthy on, on being there. But I have to tell you, I was, I was somewhat shocked. I was talking with Stephanie and our staff. Every day people come in, and it, 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 in this job, there's no possible way you can learn everything about every subject. So when people come in, that, that pejorative of lobbying, it's not. They're coming in and advocating for childhood diabetes, if it will, and providing data. It's incumbent upon me to use that data and get it right. And, and if you're allowing someone to influence you in a way that is inappropriate, that's your fault, not the person putting out the information. And the reason I bring this up is, is I have to say, when the Pentagon came to talk to us about what their structuring was going to be, the way it was presented was as poorly presented as any group that's ever come into my office. And that shocked me because I, I was an, an open door. I was already in a preparatory set as a military member and someone who has advocated in my party for spending that makes sense, and it reverted right back to kind of the old stereotypes. I, I, I think this understanding of the intersection between national security and civilian leadership, budgeting and strategic planning has got to be done predicated on data. And I was somewhat taken aback that that, that would be presented in a manner that was more emotional that was more anecdotal, um, that was more, I, I, I don't think you can come into a congressional office in Washington, D.C., representing the Pentagon and say, I'm, I'm not a Washington man, I'm a field commander. I know that and I respect that, but you're damn sure a Washington man now because this has to be done and it has to be done by civilian leadership. And that is the tone that we're dealing with. So I say that to you only because I, I want to make it clear when we pass it on. I understand the Pentagon's been placed in this position by people in civilian leadership who don't want to have the courage to make the dis tough decisions and discuss correctly what needs to be that budgeting level. But if we start at that point, all of the important decisions that, tra that transpire after that 
will be gotten wrong. And so today's discussion and the questions that, I, that, that you're going to ask and discuss amongst the folks who get it, the strategic planners in this room, the thoughtfulness that's going to happen, it is very welcome. It's welcome to me because I want the data to drive our decision making. I want the data to get this right because to be very honest with you of all, it is very clear. The Constitution is very clear and I think uh, the moral responsibility of this is my first and foremost responsibility as a member of Congress is the protection of the American citizens. That, that has to be done and, and that's both from a, a military perspective, it's from a health perspective, all those things you can see. So that there, there is nothing more important that we do. So, uh, so thank you to, uh, to the folks here at, at CSIS, all the researchers who worked on this. Thank you to you now that this is the starting point for this study, that now it's going to get out there. Now we're going to discuss what the implications of that are, uh, of that study are, and then we have to determine how we're going to implement that and not allow emotions, not allow historic turf battles, not allow anecdotal evidence to drive this because it's too important and we have to get it right. So Stephanie, thank you with that and I think um, I would be glad to, uh, to let Stephanie answer any questions that you have. <laughs> so please. Oh, I see how this works. Um, I'm actually going to forego the moderator's prerogative. I would love to ask you questions about the commission um, and, and what you have in mind um, in terms of focus areas for the commission, but the congressman has about 10 to 12 minutes left um, before he's got to head back to the Hill. So I want to open the floor. A um, couple of things. First, um, please wait for a microphone to reach you um, and speak into it. Um, second, please introduce yourself and your affiliation if you have one. And third, please ask a fairly quick question um, so that we can get to as many people as possible. So I open the floor to questions. All right, I'm going to call on myself. I used to teach high school geography. I see this <laughs> see look. This works. I see this look in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I will ask the military, uh, the Commission on the Future of the Army, um, which was an amendment um, to the National Defense Authorization Act, and ask you a little bit about. You were a co-sponsor of this, yes. um, and, and I understand you're supportive. Um, looking back at what the Air Force went through a couple of years ago and, and their commission report that came out earlier this year. Um, can I ask you, what, what is the intent underpinning um, this commission? What, what do you want it to look at? Um, what do you want it to keep in mind and aim towards? Yeah, my hope in the perfect world is, is that it, it, as we were discussing earlier, that it, that it drives the data that comes forward. And I can tell you in watching how the Air Force did this, and it may not look exactly the same, I understand that, but I can tell you in working and watching how the Air Force did their commission on their restructuring, it was apparent to me early on, both in the Reserve National Guard Forces and, and, and the Active Air Force, that the ultimate goal was to find the correct strategic balance to protect this nation. And so all players in this were looking at this and wanted that report to drive their decision making, not just worried about where the aviation assets were, where, where they were going to set, which states had over this. And so my uh, support of this, uh, of Joe's uh, commission report and what we think is, I, I think we need this because I, I, to be very honest with you, we, it, it's the elephant in the room. There's tension between the Guard and Reserves. When, when the 54 tags have to sign a letter Knowing, I, I mean, I've, this is unprecedented for me to watch this happen, that they've had to come out and go forward on that. They feel so strongly about this, and I think we need to take a step back, have the commission look at this. It's too important to get it wrong, and so my goal is, is that it provides the data and drives. I'm not looking for a preconceived outcome on this. If it says yes, the, the rotary aircraft a, a, aviation brigades need to be pulled out of the National Guard for this reason, this reason, this reason with empirical data to prove that, then I'll be the first one to say that's what we're going to have to do. And I'll go back to Minnesota and tell that commander that I stood with, by the way, three weeks ago as he deployed in charge of active forces into the Middle East, uh, that, that that's not the way it goes. So you, you can't simultaneously make the argument that we need to pull those assets out of the National Guard while you're deploying them to be in charge of active forces right now. That to me seems like a disconnect, but there may be a reason. So that's my goal, that that commission drive the decision making. And, and I, I just think that that the tension is a little too high right now. I think we, we got into these camps. And I, I am I understand General O'Neill was put in that position because of the lack of courage of people on Capitol Hill to get a budget that worked, to go through sequestration and, and the, the idiots, I always say that that's Latin for dumb as hell. And that's exactly what happened during that time. And no one wanted to take the courage to deal with that. But I also understand when, when General O'Neill made those statements, that is 
reverberating still amongst that. When I'm at a deployment ceremony and people are mentioning that as they're going downrange in defense of this nation, that's a problem. And we need to reset that relationship. My hope is the Commission can do that. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Tal Copen from Politico Pro Cybersecurity. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the suggestion that the National Guard take a more active role in cybersecurity and speak a little bit about the attitude on the Hill and perhaps any headwinds that might be there and moving in that direction. Yeah, no, I think it's right, and I was glad to see this in there, and we'll, we'll dig a little deeper into the, the granular details on this. I, I think that's absolutely the assets that we should be using, and I think it's out there. Again, I would make the case on this is I think these, this last decade of war showed us how deep those skill sets are out there. I remember when I was in Iraq, and we, and of course we all know the problems with Abu Ghraib and the things that happened was, and being there at the, at the detainment facility, and the one star who was in charge of that was a civilian fourth grade teacher. And I would make the argument, that's a hell of a good person to have in charge, because I've taught fourth grade, and you know where it's coming from. That person had an organizational skill set, both military and civilian, that would be there. And I would argue on the cybersecurity, there's the ability to do that. And, and we're going to have to become, um, again, much more on that granular level on this other than and get it out of the strategic level and I think that that's where that asset could be and I would say the mood on the hill um, that the Pentagon and, and I have to be very careful of this is because if this is the Pentagon versus the tags if this is Fort Sill versus Fairmont Worthington Mankato armories the Pentagon will lose based on sheer numbers and I don't want that because I want what's best for national security. And, and I think, though, the mood you ha they have to be careful of is, is when the tags pushed back, when the governors pushed back, they're going to get an immediate response that's much harder for the Pentagon to get. So the irony of this is, I think the report, I think what you're doing here, certainly strengthens the Pentagon's hand on the Hill in that it brings a fairness to the argument that, that take some of the emotional politics and the provincialism of, of protecting our own assets in our own states away. So, so that's where I think it stands right now, but there's a, uh, there, there's a frustration, and, and, and you saw it, and you saw, I think, the overwhelming support of these amendments proves that. Yes, sir. You could just speak, but I'm an artilleryman, so you know it's not going to go. <laughs> yeah, Ray Dubois, CSIS. Uh, Congressman, you mentioned both the tags and the governors in the same breath. Uh, my, my recollection is, having worked in this area for some time, is that more often, maybe perhaps not more often than not, but sometimes the tags and the governors come at this issue slightly differently. Yes. And your experience, whether it's Minnesota or being in, as a member of the uh, uh, caucus, how do you view that issue? I think you're absolutely right. I, I would argue that the, the differences probably collapsed over the last decade where the TAG's responsibility with large numbers of actively deployed troops that the governors relied upon them more than they had in the past, where the governors in the past were looking at floods and, and tornadoes and things like that, that dual mission purpose on this. Um, on this one, I, would, I, I think you're bringing up a very interesting point. I think that's where the sense of urgency comes on this is because the TAGs and the governors are in closer concert than I've ever seen them at any time in my career. And, and that has political implications that, that that strengthen that and, and that's why I tried to convey to the Pentagon that this is not your typical situation that's happened in the past and of course I, I again I, I can't get away from stressing this that they were put into this position by this budget and it, and it may be that that end strength number is correct it may be that the budgeting that we have that is all there is and we need to figure out how to make that happen I'm not advocating that it's more money would, would necessarily fix it but they're going to have to recognize that uh, that the states are very actively engaged at a point where I've never seen them and, and, and I think there's a sense amongst governors of listening to their tags that 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 this is this is the time. If you lose this aviation brigade, if you lose this or whatever, it's not coming back, and here are the implications. And, and I'm, I, I, I can't speak for the governors. I certainly hope they would not, but I think it would be naive to not think that there's an economic factor in those states that is driving some of this. So that's my take as I see it now. It sure feels that way. And I, and I don't, 
I think that's okay, they're working concert, but I, I, I kind of always liked the tension between the civilian leadership and, and between the governor and the TAG because I think that was healthy to make sure that we didn't go down a road that was being predicated on, we've got ours, let's keep ours, let's work together to do this if that's not the right thing. I want the independent thought to say, actually, sir, actually, governor, this is the right decision for the national security. And I know our TAGs would do that if they believed that. Their, their frustration is they don't believe that now and they don't believe their voice is being heard. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Um, and Colonel. Please. Thank you for speaking today, uh, Congressman, and thank you for supporting the National Guard. My name is Terry Quist. I'm with USDI right now, but I am a Pennsylvania Guardsman. And I wanted to ask, don't you find the argument that uh, Army leadership has been making insidious about um, the, the Black Hawks being more useful to the governors? Because I think that misses the whole point of the Guard being the primary combat reserve. You could, it, this could be the nose of the camel under the tent for strikers and Abrams. You could say the same thing about all our combat. Well, that's equipment. certainly the belief that's out there. And, and, and again, if we don't have things like this study, if we don't have this discussion today, if we don't have Joe's amendment or whatever, um, the well is poisoned enough now that that is the conclusion that our guard, reserve, and governors are going to. And, and I have to be very careful that, that I have personal opinions what I think about that part of it. I think making making that preconceived judgment before I see the data is, is dangerous, and I think as a as the co-chairman with Duncan on the Guard and Reserve Caucus, many of my colleagues are, are listening and looking on that because that is, believe it or not, in incredibly bipartisan, incredibly driven, and incredibly, I, I think, powerful tool. So yes, I, I, I agree with you on this. I, uh, I certainly have my own assumptions, but I think you're absolutely right that, that, that everything now is a belief that this is how it starts and that, and, and i be honest with you, that, 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 am I going back to taping the howitzer on the floor and toilet paper rolls? Is, is that where this is headed? And, and I think for many of us, that's, that's kind of the assumption that, that we think might be there. And, and I want to make sure the data shows, no, that's not where we're going, but it makes, this is in the nation's best interest. This is the most uh, economically viable option that we have. But no one has done that before. I mean, this is a really groundbreaking piece of work that you've done here because nobody has done it. Because it's difficult. It's difficult to quantify those skills of that fourth grade teacher deploying as a military police officer and those civilian skills that were going to be implemented. What did that save? What did that do, both in terms of security and cost, by having that guardsman in that position? And I want to be very clear on this is, there are a skill set and a unique skill set in the active force that is not in the reserve force, and, and I'm not advocating that we move it all over and, and, and switch it on that, that we need to have an open, honest discussion based on the data of where it's at, or otherwise we're going to get this wrong, and we're going to spend more money than we should. We're not going to have the national defense that we should, and, and, and it is a very unhealthy situation that took many of us felt like we worked decades to feel part of a total force that is a very unique combination, and, and I would argue has proven itself time and time again over the last decade of, of being able to sustain uh, that, that long-term combat role. Well, I would like to thank the congressman for, for sharing his thoughts. Um, clearly, you're very impassioned about this, and as well as informed, because I think what's important is for the general public to understand that not only are policymakers within the, the executive branch, but also the, the decision makers in the legislative branch fully engaged on this issue. That's right. Eager for information. And of course, it's, it's music to um, a think tanker's ears to hear, oh, we want more data. We, we can do that. Um, oh, good. So, uh, so I appreciate um, your remarks and your candor. And so please join me in thanking the congressman. Thank um, you all. Sir. Thanks, Governor. Thank you all very much. If I could ask the panelists and our esteemed moderator to, to come up to the dais. So for the next hour or so, um, we're going to focus more on um, the report. Um, before we begin, I would like to introduce our moderator. 
Today we're joined by Mr. Kim Wincup, and, and I have to say it, I didn't realize actually that when we put together a panel on the future of the Guard and, and Army issues, that it would be women. Um, and uh, I did get the comment, um, and I'm sure Kim gets this a lot, that, oh look, your moderator is a woman too. As you can see, he is not, um, but he's much more than, uh, than um, a senior advisor here at CSIS. He, he's an attorney with a broad career um, in both legislative and executive branches of the federal government in the private sector and is chair and member of a variety of boards and organizations in defense policy, education, and technology, including as chairman of the Re Reserve Forces Policy Board from 2008 until 2010. He retired in May 2011 as Senior Vice President at SAIC, where he had worked since 1995. Prior to joining CSIS, uh, Mr. Winkup held several positions in the U.S. Congress with the House Armed Services Committee, and he also served as an Assistant Secretary both in the Army and in the Air Force. So please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Winkup. Well, uh, thanks, Stephanie. I, I always regard it as a promotion when, I, when people consider me a woman, so all good with the group. Um, th this is going to be a fascinating discussion with some really good people to talk about an issue that is haunting this town right now, in my view. And I view it as a sort of, I've been watching it for way too long. I view it as sort of a Greek tragedy where people within the family are fighting with one another and, and the, the net is bad. I mean, there are dire consequences that are occurring as a result of this fight that's going on between the the National Guard and the Army, principally because programs get changed. And money gets wasted every, in the Pentagon every time programs are changed. And so we've got to get this right um, to say nothing of the fact that trust is being worsened between those elements at, at an important time. It, it always sort of amazes me when I think about this, and I've frankly been watching this up close since 1974, that the people that are fighting are the same people that figured out a way to broker a peace between the Sunnis and the Shias in Iraq. Absolutely the same individuals, and yet they have not found a way to reach a negotiated settlement on a budget problem inside the, uh, the Washington Sea Belt, Belt, which is really unfortunate. Both sides have offered compromises uh, that they thought were fair, neither accepted the other's compromise, and, it, and the fight continues. To me, this fight on the Apaches this year is sort of the, a big skirmish, but, the, but a skirmish before the big battle, which is next year over end strength, which is really, I think, ultimately going to be the heart of the matter. So this problem goes on. Uh, it needs to be solved, and I think the study this morning is going to provide a constructive effort to start that process. It doesn't attempt to answer all the questions that are out there, but it, but it does provide a strategic framework to begin to think about these problems when this issue is ultimately uh, brokered, which I think is, is going to be very important. So let me do what I'm really here for, which is to introduce the people that have most to say about it. First is Stephanie, who you've already met. Stephanie's a, um, the acting director of the Center for Homeland Defense and Counterterrorism here at CSIS, as well as being a senior fellow in the International Security Program. She has enormous experience both on the Hill with the House Armed Services Committee. She served in our embassy in Baghdad for a while, and she's been in the uh, Secretary of Defense's office, so she has enormous breadth in her experience, as do the other people on, on the group. Do Dr. Nora Bensahill is from the Center for New American Security, where she's the co-director of the Project on Responsible Defense. They've been looking at this, th these issues, um, and so she's going to share some of that with us. She has a great uh, background at RAND and, and throughout uh, the national security arena. Finally, Mackenzie Eglin. Everyone has, knows Mackenzie Eglin. She's, uh, she's well known. She's got an amazing background, actually. She's, she, she is now at the Ware National Security or Security Studies Center at American Enterprise Institute. But she served in both the House and the Senate, which is, to my way of thinking, quite unusual. Um, she served with the, in the Secretary of Defense's office as, and the Joint Staff, and she was with the QDR. So she's seen this problem in. Uh, a lot of different ways, and she's written a lot about it and has some great views. So we're going to start now with Stephanie outlining a bit about the report, providing the framework and the information and backing this report, and then we'll, we'll move to Nora and then to Mackenzie. Stephanie. Thanks, Kim. Um, I will try not to go into 
way too much detail. Um, you know, whenever you put together a, a 60 some odd page report, you get vested in it. Um, and so I'm going to try to just quickly outline the rationale for the report, the methodology, and then quickly go through findings and recommendations. You can find a chart containing the findings and recommendations in the executive summary. Um, and so you can see how we've aligned the 18 different findings with six recommendations. Um, and that's sort of my cheat sheet. Um, not suggesting that you follow along, but just telling you that it's there for, for reference if you want to. Now, as I mentioned uh, in my introduction of Congressman Waltz, the U.S. Armed Forces are uh, facing a rapidly shifting environment. Not only are major combat operations coming to an end and new and evolving challenges emerging, um, we've got budget issues. Um, more than that, the Armed Forces have gotten the clear signal that they must continue to prepare for the possibility they'll be called on to rapidly provide significant combat capabilities in the future. So these dynamics have created, as I mentioned earlier, a great deal of uncertainty within the Department of Defense. Services are seeking to clearly and articulately define their value to the nation. In addition, as part of the reserve component, um, the Army National Guard faces a unique set of circumstances and dynamics in terms of their dual role and missions. Um, we were asked to examine, as I mentioned before, strategic level issues facing the Guard. And so our hope was that this report will provide policymakers and practitioners with unbiased insights and recommendations to assist in outlining potential future responsibilities of the Guard. To do so, uh, we conducted extensive open source research and interviews. It was one um, point of pride that we wanted to keep everything unclassified so that we could share it with the public and encourage public discourse. We've supplemented that literature review with some 30, 40 interviews with um, key personnel active duty, guard, um, out at different commands, tags, assistant tags, as well as um, staffers and others, both within the executive branch and the um, legislative branch. And we had, um, we ended up having four roundtable discussions that were not for attribution. The first discu uh, discussed principles and levers, or as we w w can also call roles and missions. Um, we also talked about cybersecurity, building partnership capacity, overseas missions, and then the domestic and homeland security missions um, here in the United States. Reflecting thoughts um, from the roundtables and interviews as well as literature review, I want to quickly go through um, the findings and their um, corresponding recommendations. So the first four findings were um, put together. The first one is that tensions between active duty and National Guard officials perhaps heightened at times by advocacy efforts of outside groups have increased. I don't think this is um, anything new, you know, newsworthy, and it's not going to be a headline, but it's cer certainly something that we wanted to point out first and foremost, is that these tensions are unhealthy. Um, because they're increasing, as the Congressman has talked about, um, you know, you, you are potentially hurting what the Army wants to do, total force Army wants to do, and you are, in fact, hurting national security of the United States. Let's not, I, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but at the end of the day, you know, infighting, or as, as Kim referred to, sort of the, the Greek tragedy, fratricide, um, or just short of fratricide, is not healthy um, for national security. And, and so how do you move past that is one question that we try to address in, in the report. The second finding was that dialogue has focused primarily on budget considerations and their impact on force structure and size not on defining the future total force army purpose, mission, priorities, and requirements. So that's what, one way, as you've heard from the, the congressman, so he's apparently a very good advocate for this report, um, but talking about how do you get out of the tensions if you take it out of the budget context just to talk about roles and missions first and then let budget and requirements and priorities fall from that. Third, there is no agreement regarding the appropriate level of integration between the active duty army and the guard. Um, that is, do you uh, integrate at the individual level? Do you do something along the lines of what the Air Force does at the unit level? Um, and so uh, we, we talked through that in the report. And the fourth finding is a significant disagreement regarding how to compare readiness levels and training days for the active component in the National Guard. This is a bone of contention where the numbers don't match up. They're using different sources. Um, they're using different ways of counting. Um, Perhaps we should get a fourth grade teacher in here to, to, to help them figure out how to compare apples to apples and, um, and, and the like. 
But those four findings led to our first recommendation, which was before the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act for Fiscal 15 was passed, was to actually endorse the idea of having a commission and going one further and, and patterning a little bit off of what the Air Force has done is to create a total force task force or what they call TF2, which was a group of three two-star two uh, general officers, one from active, one from reserve, one from guard. Now granted, all of them had, um, had been active duty at one point in the, the Air Force construct, but they were there to represent their component's interest um, and came up with some recommendations for General Welch that I think have been taken very seriously. Um, and they've also continued that construct, um, total force, I think they call it continuity at this point, um, to continue to look at these issues um, very seriously. And so I think through a commission, if it's properly focused and properly staffed, um, with both with staff and commissioners, um, and I think the total force task force route might also be helpful. The fifth finding uh, has its own recommendation um, because of the uh, attention has gotten. There is no common cost model when you consider the active duty Army and, uh, and the Army National Guard. And you see that in a lot of reports. I mean, even the um, Office of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation at the, at the Pentagon has talked about it's very difficult. Uh, you are comparing apples to oranges when you talk to active duty and guard folks about what it actually costs to train to a, an appropriate readiness level and then deploy, mobilize and deploy um, troops. And so what we have come to recommend is let's take it out of Army channels, let's take it out of the Pentagon and ask the Congressional Budget Office to take a look at numbers. Um, just because I worked for, for Congress for a while doesn't mean I'm always pro-legislative um, bodies, but I think the CBO has a unique position where they can actually take a look at, at, at um, impartially an unbiased way um, to look at costs regarding um, both active and reserve components. Of course, they should undertake this task in coordination with DOD to make sure that um, numbers, you know, that there is broad agreement on um, movement going forward. The sixth finding, um, their attentions not only regarding active and, and reserve, but their attentions regarding the use of Title 32, and which is for um, uh, state missions funded by the, Depart the funded by the federal government, um, and when it's appropriate to um, to mobilize the guard under Title 32. Uh, the seventh finding was um, there is flexibility regarding balance between the guard's foreign and domestic missions, and we can talk a little bit about that if you'd like. The eighth and ninth are um, that Congress has proved amenable to adding National Guard authorities. Um, so the nascent dual status commander, um, it's been around for a little while, and exercised, for example, during Hurricane Sandy. Um, they've improved integration of state and federal operations. So Congress, is, as, as the Congressman has put, pushing on an open door. Um, and so if, if we come up with ideas um, for how to use the Guard going forward, it looks like it might actually be able to go through Congress. And the ninth, the Army National Guard has the capacity to increase partnerships for domestic missions and to serve as supplemental force for other departments and agencies, particularly the Department of Homeland Security. These four, six, seven, eight, and nine, these findings really talk about, um, and we recommend reviewing the reimbursement processes and funding amounts related to the use of the National Guard. What is the appropriate use of the National Guard and Homeland Security? Um, we suggest that the Guard could leave, lead a group involving interagency and state level partners to develop and maintain critical in, interagency partnerships in advance of crises, not as a reaction to them, um, and to talk about the responsibilities of each of the players and, and not only what their actual responsibilities are, but what their funding responsibilities are, because there is broad disagreement on that. Um, I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, the next four recommendations deal a lot with building partnership capacity and overseas missions. Um, the tenth finding is that the state, uh, the state partnership program under the National Guard is likely to remain a valuable tool. The eleventh is that the National Guard is taking steps to incorporate new partners in the Asia Pacific arena and in, and in Africa, but there are challenges, there could be challenges in expanding the state partnership program significantly. The twelfth is the Guard brings unique capabilities that cannot be easily replaced by other services, and the thirteenth is the state partnership program can complement building partner capacity efforts of other federal agencies such as State Department, but as such efforts are expanded into Asia Pacific and Africa, 
there will be an increased need for close coordination. This is another one of those. We, we got it. We know, we know we need to coordinate if we're expanding. Um, the, the corresponding recommendation for this one is to continue the state partnership program with the Guard closely coordinating with the geographic combatant commanders and interagency partners. Um, and because most of the Guard's bilateral relationships are in Europe, the Guard should carefully consider how, in an era of limited resources, it can shift to the Asia-Pacific region and to Africa. Um, will they have to give up any of their partnerships uh, or at least decrease the activity associated with particular partnerships in order to afford um, this rebalance to Asia and also Africa? Uh, the 14th finding, so we have only three left, um, or four left. Uh, Long-term, relatively stable assignments might be a solution for using Guard forces overseas in peacetime, uh, allowing them to gain valuable operational experience and 15, Guard forces may offer specialized capabilities useful in overseas scenarios, such as weapons of mass destruction detection and management on the Korean Peninsula. These two really talk about, um, you know, the Guard's role in the Sinai, in Kosovo, Bosnia, other places that had been longer term, relatively stable assignments, um, had shifted back to the active duty army um, a, a, not too long ago. And so, it, it, you know, they weren't training exercises for the Guard, but they certainly kept their skills fresh. And so using the Guard in that capacity, when you know you're going to be somewhere for a while, whether it's stabilization operations, reconstruction operations, or the like, um, you may find real value in the Guard. And finally, the last recommendation is really just hinges on cyber, um, which goes back to the young lady's question earlier um, from Politico. So this is a growth area. Um, it's seen as a growth area for all of the services and all of the components of all of the services. Um, the question that we had and the findings that we had is that, you know, the Guard and in particular um, the National Guard Association has really stre stressed the, the role of the Guard going forward in cyber. However, the evidence they offer is anecdotal. Um, it hasn't been tracked. There's not a lot of data to support. You know, if they say we have not lots of National Guard members um, who are involved in companies like Microsoft, Intel, Google, Amazon, but you find out that those guys are maintenance employees or other kinds of employees. They're not actually the technical experts. Um, what we need to do is track green sheets on people and say, all right, so what cyber capabilities could you bring to the table? It's not enough that you work at Google, for example. What are your skills? And be able to measure that and actually keep track of that as a skill set. Um, moreover, US Cyber Command and US Army Cyber are quickly laying the foundation for and staffing a cyber structure now. And we act, there is actually an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act in the House that talked about creating cyber protection roles for guards, guard members. Um, so our recommendation following from these findings is to, to integrate guard cyber capabilities, but we have to figure out what they are first um, and then integrate them in a very smart way. And we need to do this quickly because this is a fast moving area. And with that, um, We've laid out now the, the 18 findings and the six recommendations. I'll be open for questions after my colleagues speak, um, if you have any. Um, if not, um, please feel free to peruse the, the 60 some odd page report in front of you. Um, you know, I've committed it to memory by now, so uh, no question is too small. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, Nora, please, I know the Center for New America Security has been doing some work in this regard. Please help us all think about it. Great, thanks very much for that, uh, that kind introduction. Uh, I want to start by congratulating Stephanie and her team for what I think is really a terrific report. I think that you know, the level of detail and thought that went into this and thinking through all of these issues is a very important contribution to what we all know, we've heard this morning, but we all know is a very contentious and fractious debate. Um, and I would echo the Congressman's call for more data and analysis of that data because that's, I think, you know, as, as analysts and thinkers in this area, we all want the decisions that are made going forward to be in the best national interest. That's a point, uh, you know, you've heard a lot today, but I think uh, it's, it bears repeating as much as possible on this particular issue. Um, I, I, I think the report is terrific. There are three particular issues I'd like to highlight. It was hard to figure out what I, how to construct my remarks today because, uh, as you can tell, there are so many interesting findings and issues uh, that, that the report has brought up. Um, but I want to focus on, on three ones in particular. Um, the first is about building a more productive relationship between the active component and the reserve component in the Army. And I think, you know, as I said, this is where everybody is starting because, uh, you know, the various terms have been used. The congressman was m the most polite about it, as you might expect from an elected official. Um, it, it's 
you know, fratricide and open warfare is probably a, a better and more accurate description of, of what's going on today. Um, and it's going on in public, which is a particularly bad sign. You know, you, you might expect this to be going on behind closed doors when budgets are tight. That, of course, that happens, but it's become very public. Um, and I think the report does rightly note that there's a blame game going on and that both sides are to blame. And there's a lot of finger pointing, but uh, both sides of this have, have exacerbated tensions and uh, has contributed, the, the quote in the report that I like is, each side has contributed to this dis to the distrust that underlies the tension going on today. And I think that's really important to, to recognize. Um, for better or worse, an army commission is going to happen in my view. I don't see how that gets avoided at this point because it has escalated into this open warfare. Um, I think the key question then is not so much about what the commission will say on the report itself. Obviously, those are very important things. The composition of the commission will be extraordinarily important. But I think, you know, if, if you, you know, accept my, my assumption that this is going to happen, the, in some ways the issue that is just as important or perhaps even more important than what the piece of paper that the commission reports out says is how the Army then tries to heal from this fratricide that, that has been going on, how that, the commission report can be used to sort of defuse tensions, and how the Army can move on to have a more productive ACRC relationship in its aftermath. And I think here there's um, a very important parallel to be drawn with the Air Force Commission, as, as Stephanie notes. Um, the, one of the, I think, the very, very important things that happened there, again, was not just that the commission issued its report. There are a lot of things in the report that haven't been implemented, that have been ignored, uh, you know, that the Air Force hasn't implemented, that Congress hasn't followed up on. But I was, uh, I had some notes on this, but Stephanie saved me the airtime by talking about um, the total force task force that the Air Force formed as part of the commission experience and particularly in its aftermath to bring together uh, initially three two stars, I think now in the continuity phase they're down to one stars, that, but still continue to be speaking with a common voice, working out these issues internally. Certainly I have no illusion that there's peace and harmony uh, at all times among the people that are involved in that but it's helping them come together, resolve their differences internally, and provide a more unified and less fractious public view. And I think that's where the Army will need to go uh, in the aftermath of the, uh, what I think is an inevitable commission, again, regardless of whatever the piece of paper, the, you know, the big you know, doorstop report that the commission um, eventually uh, publishes. I also think that this is something that the next chief of staff of the Army is going to have to play a very active leadership role on. Um, for better or worse, and I am not impugning any of the individuals involved in either the active component or reserve component leadership right now, the current leaders are vested in that debate and, and not seen by as, as uh, impartial or credible by the other side in the debate, for better or worse. Um, and so I think when the new chief of staff of the Army uh, comes in uh, next summer or fall, this, you know, healing this rift uh, is going to have to be one of the very highest leadership priorities uh, that that person faces. That leads into the second point that I wanted to highlight about this report. Um, and, and I think here maybe there's, you know, this is an area where the report doesn't go quite far enough, which means that it's ripe for, for future research uh, rather than a criticism of your, you know, a failure to do it. Um, the report points out all sorts of tensions that are going on now. And I, as I said, I think it's correct as far as it goes. You know, questions about what the structure of the Army should look like. And, and here, you know, one of the big ones that comes out in the report and in the debate is, you know, should, uh, you know, should the Guard be a strategic or operational reserve? You know, a huge uh, scoping question. Um, that's important. I'm actually starting to find that that's, for me at least, not that productive a way to start thinking about moving forward. Um, those concepts, you know, made a lot of sense uh, in the past as we were thinking about fighting a Cold War enemy um, and as we were talking about, you know, rotational demands for the wars of the past decade. But for me, the, the key question right now is a much broader one that's outside the scope of this report, which is how should the Army as a whole, the entire Army as a service, organize itself to maximize its capabilities at a time when its force structure and its end strength are declining significantly? And to me, that is going to require some very creative organizational thinking. It goes, and this goes beyond the active reserve component debate um, of, on how you structure the Army. Um, the Army has been focused, rightly, for the past 13 years on fulfilling the rotational demands of the two wars, and that's exactly how it should have been. 
But the strategic guidance that came out in 2012 that's been affirmed by the QDR is basically saying, again, whether you like it or not, whether you think this is the right strategic choice or not, the Army isn't going to have rotational depth. Right? We're not going to be sizing ourselves for, two, you know, for, for large scale stability operations. We're going to be uh, responding to events um, at a time when we should not expect to be going in with a rotational base. Um, and so I think that that changes a whole lot of ways that the Army needs to think about itself in ways that affect the active reserve relationship. So in a paper I recently published through CNAS that looked at some of the key issues that I think the QDR didn't address, um, one of the things that I argued is that we should be thinking about all Army units, regardless of component, in terms of the time they take to deploy, rather than in terms of strategic or operational reserve. The forces that you want to deploy in the first four to six months almost certainly have to be on active duty, you know, because there are readiness issues with getting uh, reserve component forces into the fight that quickly. To me, that, you know, you, there's going to be a sprinkling of reserve and guard, you know, enablers here and there. But primarily, that's what you're going to want to put in the active component. Forces that are going to deploy after 12 months, say, make much more sense to me to be in the reserve component because you have the time then from either when an operation starts or when you get strategic warning that you need to start preparing. Um, then you do have time, and frankly, since you're talking about responding to a crisis, presumably an influx of some cash, uh, to do readiness and training to get those units be that are able to handle an unexpectedly large contingency that will be going on um, and possibly even growing new units. I think this is something that the Army is not thinking seriously enough about, although I understand the bureaucratic, bureaucratic reasons why they don't want to touch it. To me, the interesting case is in the middle, right? What do you do with the forces that you want to deploy into a fight somewhere between the four to six month part? point and the 12 month point. And here's where I think uh, I argued in this paper that I think we need to start looking at some type of hybrid or blended units of what are now active and reserve component forces. Um, I want to say up front, I know how controversial this is. I don't think you can do that by taking the current organizational structures, the current training structures and so on, and just saying, come together and it'll work. It won't. We've tried that in the past. So a lot of things would have to be changed in order to make this work, including deployment uh, policies and schedules, including training resources and so on. So you can't just take what you have today and make this work. But I think we need to start thinking very creatively about how we might need to change things going into the future. And I think that kind of organizational creative thinking has been sorely lacking in the Army, and frankly, in all of the military services um, going forward. Um, and I think that this is also something that needs to be high on the agenda for the new chief of staff of the Army. Finally, my, my third point um, is to talk about uh, cyber as a National Guard issue, um, which I think is very important here. And I, I, in some ways, I want to use cyber as a broader example. Um, the report notes that, that the DOD cyber force is understaffed and that public-private partnerships are uh, critical for a robust cyber defense, and I think that's exactly right. Um, and I do agree that data on how this is working right now is lacking and is anecdotal, and that's, that's absolutely right. But one of the things that I think often gets lost in, in, in these debates is that one of the real advantages that the Guard and the Reserve bring to the table is their ability to tap into civilian skill sets that the military might not be able to access otherwise. Um, and in my mind, cyber is a perfect example of where you want to do that, that there are people who exist in the civilian sector who do, would not have a propensity to serve on active duty, who have critical skills that they can contribute to uh, the cyber uh, environment and to protecting U.S. Uh, national interests more broadly. Um, I have to admit, I, I laughed out loud at a particular line in the report. Um, you, it, it's not what you wrote. You quoted an uh, unnamed roundtable participant, so I hope I'm not offending anyone who's in the audience who might have said this in a roundtable. Um, but you noted that a participant expressed concern that, quote, the Guard will not be able to keep cyber capabilities current over time when serving as part-time citizen soldiers. And I just laughed out loud at that because, to me, it's the, we have the exact opposite problem. Right? It's the folks who are in the military on active duty who are not necessarily keeping their skills in the cyber realm as fresh as those in the civilian sector. Now, you need people full time to be working on military networks and you know, to specialize in that. So I'm certainly not arguing against that. But if you look at the threats facing the United States as a general, not just in general, not just DOD networks, we have a very, very big challenge. 
And I think that drawing on those civilian skill sets, making sure that the people who are at Microsoft are doing cyber tasks, not you know, working in other specialties, is extremely important. And here again, I think you know, we need to think creatively moving forward. Um, I was out visiting uh, some members of the California National Guard in Silicon Valley in December and was incredibly impressed with what a unit that's based at Moffett Field is doing to forge connections in Silicon Valley to try to bring in um, skills and expertise, not just from individuals who are serving in the National Guard there, but being proactive and reaching out to companies and connecting them with other folks in the military. Um, and I think we need to think creatively about creating guard units in particular areas of the country where civilian skill sets are congregated and focusing those units on attracting those skills. It makes sense to me. You'd want a lot of guard units in Silicon Valley drawing on people who were in probably New York and the Boston High Tech Corridor too, drawing on those civilian skill sets, focusing on that as a national mission and being able to contribute. Um, so I think you're right about, in terms of where we are today, but moving forward, I think we need to be much more creative about how we tap into civilian expertise, particularly in the technology sector, because technology is now, you know, not, it's not like the Cold War when it was being driven by defense. It's now being driven by the private sector, uh, technological innovation and development, to make sure we can bring that into the national security apparatus. And I'll stop there and turn it over to Mackenzie. Thanks, Nora. You, you fascinating comments, as always. Um, Mackenzie, your, your breadth of your experience always leads to valuable comments, so please help us. Thank you. Thanks again for CSIS for hosting this event. To Kudos, I echo Nora, to Stephanie for leading an outstanding report. I thoroughly enjoyed looking through it. I think you nailed it uh, on virtually every level in terms of the scope of the problem and the relevant and realistic solutions, because if you're proposing anything that's not realistic, it's just really words on paper, as, as we all know. And so, uh, Spending a lot of time in the budget world, I, I, I like Nora, thought I could go in a hundred different directions this morning, so I'll try to, I'll try to just, just take a hard line look at the numbers. And uh, I spend a lot of time with the Air Force, and Nora and I sat in a couple of Total Force Task Force meetings, exhaustive briefings <laughs> in the past, uh, and, and I've spent a lot of time in the last five years talking to senior Air Force officials, active duty, reserve component, civilian, about what they've gone through and what they've learned. And their problems didn't just start with you know, A-10 divestitures and uh, some of the other issues that came up in the FY13 budget. This actually really kicked off before 2005 with the, with the, the base closure and realignment round of, of that year. And all the way leading up to non-disclosures under Secretary Gates and the pivotal budget year of 2010, et cetera. So there, this was a long time in the making and it would behoove the Army to, to um, like any good family, sort of sit down and have the intervention with each other and say, when did this really start? What's really the problem? Because it's not just the Army aviation restructure. We, we know that. That's not just the only issue here. It just sort of symbolizes what are some other challenges. And the budget is forcing these questions. The, the Budget Control Act and, and its subsequent changes mean that we live in a world of sequestration and light. It's here to stay, unfortunately. Um, and it's not going away. And while Congress keeps amending uh, sequestration as each year that it's implemented as it continues, they're amending it less and less and providing less relief each year, which is really sad, which means eventually, which means they're conditioned over time to one, live with sequester, and two, there's uh, fewer relief valves available to, to lessen or blunt the impact of, of sequestration. So I call it sequestration light because really only 43 billion of the Budget Control Act has ta been taken off the table since its passage, including full sequestration. That's a drop in the bucket in, in this world that we all live in here uh, this morning and we know. And so, um, so what does that really mean? So that means that, as Kim said, this is really about end strength. Uh, and, and it's about people who have jobs who do what, who, who support in this case, for example, if we're talking aviation, who support aircraft. And as, as my, my favorite colleague here in the audience, General Schwartz, has used to say, iron on the ramp, okay? So if there's fewer dollars to support fewer tails, then you have to have fewer people. And it's gonna come from everywhere. So this is really about winners in this budget environment are, are people who lose less than everyone else. But you're still, everyone's still a loser. And I hate to be the skunk at the garden party, but it's time for sort of tough love and some real talk. I don't agree with this outcome, but that's where we are. And so what do they say about compromise? 
Compromise means that everybody who's a negotiating party to the compromise has to leave it, the, the compromise a little unhappy, or it's not a real compromise. And that's not what I'm seeing coming from the parties at this discussion. I'm going to be honest, it's particularly in the reserve component. They're not unhappy. That worries me about compromise. And so I'm, we're at a point where boilerplate solutions won't cut it anymore, which is why this report and Nora's ideas and others are helpful. We're also at a point where, where uh, laundry lists of what have you done for me lately aren't going to cut it either, because that's just not the environment that we live in. And I was pleasantly surprised at the congressman's remarks where he said he would accept the commission's reports, whatever it's finding. I hope that holds true for all of his colleagues. I, I don't prejudge it either. But let's talk for a moment about the two sets of solutions that, that both of my colleagues have talked about this morning and the congressman. So I want to make, I think what's missing on Capitol Hill is an understanding of what the difference are. I, when I watched the hearing with the Army leadership on, on the aviation restructure proposal, I think it was in the Senate very recently, I was parsing every word uh, like a think tanker and live tweeting, of course. And um, there's a big, the, the, the members, um, the, the gentleman testifying understood, but I don't think Congress fully understands. And so I want to extend this brief uh, 101 to everyone. The commission is outsiders. The total force task force is insiders, OK? And so there's a big difference in sort of what they, what they can and should do for the United States Army. Uh, and what, what role they can play. So um, my former boss, my gosh, in the 90s, General Sullivan over at AUSA, you know, he said, we don't need a bunch of outsiders telling the Army what to do. And in some ways, he's right. In other ways, there's, it's, it's helpful to have outsiders come in and, and look at things. But as long as we're clear on, on what the purpose is behind each. So as the congressman alluded to, the commission is to help represent the interests of governors, of TAGs, of, of jobs and employment in states and districts and sort of as more national perspective. Uh, politicians, frankly, that's, that's really the politicians speak to politicians. Governors are politicians. Members of Congress are politicians. They should be able to talk to each other, albeit in, with different stakeholders. Um, but it's an outsider's look at the Army. A lot of what we're talking about this morning and the challenges here, sort of the infighting, is, is an insider problem. And it's, in, and it's always painful to watch the dirty laundry come out into the public. And like I said, we've seen this with the Air Force. Uh, but they've, they've come a long way uh, since, since they've learned some lessons. And the total force task force kind of solution is an insider fix, if it becomes one, or at least an insider methodology to address some of the problems that Stephanie described as integration. Um, for the active and reserve component, um, dialogue on missions, requirements, purpose, et cetera, all the kinds of uh, big questions for the US Army. And so how does the Army, the whole Army, get to yes? I don't care what the guard solutions in isolation are, and I don't care what the reserve component solutions are in isolation, and I don't even care what the active component solutions are in isolation. I want everyone to get to yes as a whole, because I'm really tired of the same old behavior. It doesn't work anymore, because everybody's losing. And so it can't be, well, we cost less if in this scenario, so therefore we should be, you know, we should grow more, we should be cut less, et cetera. It's just not the world that we live in. So I want to know how the Army National Guard is going to stay a unique contributor to the total force and remain what it's always been, which is a force multiplier, punches above its weight, scrappy. It's kind of startup-like, right? It's, it's doing things that its counterparts couldn't dream of in the active component. And that's its beauty and its value. And it needs to continue uh, in, that, in that same spirit, if, if Mackenzie is asking. So I will briefly make one comment on the aviation restructuring. Love it or hate it, you have to respect it. OK? I'm not saying do it, and I'm not saying don't do it. But you have to respect the, the proposal, because it was innovative, something Nora talked about, uh, provocative. It's bold, and it's cost neutral, and that's really important here. And it tried to minimize the disruption and the loss to all parties, which, what did I say, is key in a compromise. Everybody has to lose a little bit. But in theory, everybody's going to gain something else. Maybe they didn't even know that they expected. So I want to talk about what, what is the sum uh, being greater than the parts. I have a couple of other thoughts. But like any smart panelist, I'm just going to wrap it up and open it to Q&A. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all our panelists for doing exactly what was expected, which is a fascinating setup of a, a difficult problem. It, it, it's interesting that the problem that's 
each side sees in the other the enormous professionalism on the active side, the public policy, so public general support on the on the reserve side. If they, they see those as problems in each, but if they were put together, it would make the Army an unbelievably effective organization in our government, but it isn't the case today. So we've, we've got a great dialogue started. I suspect, I'm confident actually, that most of the people in this room are here because they have a strong interest in it. So help us with this dialogue. Ask the panelists questions. Please wait till the microphone comes to you if you have a question, and then we will look forward to, to seeing this dialogue uh, develop as it needs to for the country. Questions? Sir. Thank you. Andrew Smith. I'm an independent researcher from Australia. In the spirit of something that Mackenzie offered to uh, uh, that there can be value uh, in the views of an outsider looking in. I'd like to offer one perhaps naive observation as an outsider uh, and follow that with a question. Um, uh, internationally, and I've done a certain amount of, uh, of comparative work on this, um, every country experiences tensions between its active and reserve components. It's a reality of everything, uh, particularly in the West. It seems to me that the US has made the problem much worse for itself because of the way in which it's chosen to organise itself. The order of magnitude of difficulty coming from the fact that instead of having a regular army and army reserve uh, alone, uh, it has, has added the complicating factor of a National Guard and the National Guard has federal affiliations with, with the states of origin. So your problem is much worse than anyone else's. It means that the, the likelihood of getting to uh, an optimal decision about how to apply the nation's resources to solve the various problems that those things do is, is much harder now. The naivety is that perhaps uh, is there any realistic political alternative to it? Could you start with a clean sheet of paper and come up with a better solution to this now? I suspect the answer to that is, is no. Uh, what I would offer is that there are other countries in the world that are approaching essentially the same problems. In other words, how to cost effectively maintain uh, ground force readiness at an adequate level for the, the country's international security needs um, and to have uh, resources available for domestic missions as well. Um, they are doing it a little bit more easily and probably, I suspect, in acknowledging what um, Stephanie said about the inadequacy of the metrics we have at the moment, they're probably doing it more cheaply than the United States is doing it at the moment too. So is there any room politically for benchmarking US practice against practices anywhere else in the world uh, and trying to see if that can add the creativity that appears to be absent um, or that the country seems to be struggling to find at the moment in resolving this problem? So the way I would address this um, is, is not that the problem is worse, is that it's more challenging um, because of the different moving parts. Um, because I can, I, I'm only familiar with the UK example in, in terms of dealing with um, different aspects of the military structure. And my quick answer is I don't think it's possible to start from a clean sheet of paper. There's way too much history. I mean, you're talking hundreds of years. Um, and you know, it, it's funny, in, in our interviews, we, when we talk to um, different kinds of professionals, we got some very different answers about, all right, so where, where do you think the National Guard should have its priority? And some said, well, clearly they are a state militia. That is how they were formed, and their allegiance is to the state. And then you talk to the Guard members, and they said, no, 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 we are a national security force. We are, you know, federal first, and then state second. Um, the answer is both. Both are right. You know, they have a dual mission, um, and there is no way that will ever be clean. Um, and I think what the congressman said earlier is that, you know, in the last 12, 13 years, you've really seen um, the Guard change in terms of focus areas and capabilities, um, and that's something that some governors have seen real value in, and other governors are more of the, of the mindset of, well, that was all well and good, but now it's time for them to come home and focus on what we want them to focus on in, in terms of state missions. So long, long-winded answer to your what should have required a short answer, which is no, I don't think it's possible to start from a clean slate. I think there are lessons to be learned, and I'm now that you mentioned that I, I will pursue some um, just comparative 
um, structures and comparative cultures in terms of looking at how active and, and reserve components are treated um, in other countries. But yeah, that wasn't part of uh, our study, unfortunately. Um, and I and it'll be interesting to see what we can find in that realm. Anyone else? Yeah, this goes back to the fundamental, you know, blessing and curse of American politics, which is our federalist system, right? I mean, this this is the states versus federal tension playing out in the military security arena that we see it play out in in all sorts of other, uh, you know, political spaces in this country. Um, Mackenzie and I were actually both uh, at a, a dinner talking to some folks from the UK who had been involved in these reforms, and it was amazing. You know, I don't draw on my academic political science training all that often, um, <laughs> but it, it was amazing how quickly, you know, you know, the lessons learned were very interesting, and you know, I thought that they had a very innovative approach. Of, they had a, like sort of an all-star commission, and then they brought in someone from the outside to lead it. It was amazing how much this, you know, devolved into American Politics 101. Um, and just saying, you know, our our system, you can't get done in our system what you can do in a parliamentary system to make those kinds of changes. It's just fundamental to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and so, you know, that's why it is the, you know, the challenge of managing these issues in a federal system. So I'll just briefly add to your question. So what, it rate, what my answer would be is, Stephanie's probably, Stephanie is right, but what we can do is the politics better, okay? That's ex I was just going to go down the same road as Nora challenge of having three women, we, we all have very similar thoughts on this subject. Um, the politics of this could be handled much better. And so and I don't mean learn from the Air Force and the Army should have done X, Y, Z different. I mean, when I was listening to the congressman talk, for example, and he talked about General Odierno's plan on the aviation restructure. Well, I, when we're thinking of the total Army and we're thinking of a major, major reorganization of this magnitude, John McHugh, the Secretary of the Army, and politician, former member representing upstate New York, Fort Drum, I think, and other areas. Uh, Chuck Hagel, politician, former senator from Nebraska, Secretary of Defense. Barack Obama, president. Those three men should have been out there talking to the governors, saying, hey, politician to politician, this is what we got to do, guys. I know you need jobs. I know you want aircraft. I know you want to see things flying. I get that. It's money. It's it's you need it for disaster relief, et cetera. But you know, politician, politician, and all. This is the deal. And I'm I'm very dismayed when it's you know Odierno's plan. Okay. So there's there there's something to be learned here in the the politics of these decisions. On Capitol Hill, it should have been the secretaries of the Army and Defense testifying, not General Odierno and the Reserve. Uh, there's a space for that. That's a second panel, and that's important to to talk about. But we all know, what did, we, what did I say about the commission? It's for outsiders. Most of these outsiders are politicians who have a problem with the plan. So politicians need to deal with each other. And, and then the, 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 the ACRC mix and the integration and the dialogue and the intra-family issues within the Army need to be dealt with internally. And so I, I, would, be, I, would, I would say it's a great lesson learned. I'll add it into Stephanie's report. I'll write it in the back and sign it for anyone who needs. But the politics can be handled much better and differently in the future. Other questions? Sir. Hi, I'm Mike Waite from uh, the National Guard Association. One thing that, uh, that seems to be missing in the report is something called the uh, Abrams Doctrine dating back to the mid-70s when I was a brand new lieutenant over in Germany and I saw what, what the devastation of the Vietnam War had on, on morale, on how the country felt about the services. And for the last 40 years now, we have built on the concept of the total force, where General Abrams said, I won't go to war without the Guard and Reserve anymore because that involves hometown America. Uh, whenever you activate the uh, attack battalion in Warrensburg, Missouri, you activate all the little communities around there. When you activate a, an aid 64 battalion at Fort Hood, 70% of the people live on Fort Hood. They shop there. They go to the hospital, they send their kids there, that affects Fort Hood or uh, James or Joan out in Missoula, Montana is going, their unit's being activated at Fort Hood. But when you involve the communities of America, you get the support of America behind you. And this may be a little dark uh, aspect of the ARI, whenever you take all the equipment, you get all the missions and you get all the money. Therefore, 
you don't involve America in that mission. And we don't need just National Guardsmen to be truck drivers or, or paving of roads. We need uh, National Guardsmen to be in the mix, in the combat, in the fight, because America wants their sons and daughters to protect them. And it's just not an active force. It should be the local communities. And that's how you're going to get the support of America, not by having everybody on an active duty post go to war in a combat mission. I take the criticism that we didn't include the Abrams Doctrine. Um, what we were you know, trying to do is to look at how things have evolved since 2001. Um, and so I, I take that criticism to heart. Um, you'll also note in the report, we don't have a call out box or specifically mention the aviation restructuring. We don't um, for a couple of reasons. One is it was a moving target um, while the report was being written and then sent off to publishing. But also two, I'm not sure it's a great example, right, of, of either goodness or badness. I'm still not sure of how something was handled, of, of how the aviation restructuring topic is being handled. Um, Mackenzie's absolutely right. The politicians sort of um, dropped the ball, uh, willing, you know, consciously or unconsciously, um, they should have been out there. Um, I'm not so sure, you know, it, was this a test case? Was it, is it something that, you know, one and done, we're going to do aviation right now and then, you know, maybe something in a couple of years. Um, and so I absolutely agree that communities need to be involved. We, we reference that a little bit in the report, um, but probably not enough. And I, and I take that critique to heart. So thank you. It's an, it's an excellent point. And it raises a question sort of more broadly, not just for the Army, but for the Air Force in particular, the Army and the Air Force, is it time to revisit the Abrams Doctrine? I, I tend to agree, you know, that there's great value in, in its wisdom and, and the, the rationale and thinking behind it. I, I have, I have two, two thoughts that came to mind to that excellent point. One is then the problem is with the war plans, okay? Because the war plans have been revised downward. They've been scaled downward, you know, no long-term, you know, short regime, change, deny, punish until we can get over here, et cetera. They're now down into hours and days and minutes. There's nothing long-term. There's nothing over six months in the war plans anymore. And that's because primarily because of budgets, but the president will tell you yesterday and other times. But it's also because that's what he wants. He's, he's desiring to reduce US military activity around the world. So the issue is the war plans. And when the war plans say that you know, our Air Force has to be there and, Apache, and, and, and Apache fighting helicopters have to be there within the first X days, hours, et cetera, that's the problem. That's the issue. Not you know um, how and, and to, to Nora's point. And so therefore, how who can get there and how fast can they get there? But it also is a political. You know, it's not just a war plan. But it was these were revised downward because of political decisions and reason reasons. Uh, I I would tell you in in several meetings with various army officials and perhaps they've told you this same thing, but it will benefit the audience to hear this. All. Army aviation pilots are combat aviators. There's no doubt about it. Not just Apache pilots. Now, they're granted they're pretty kick-ass helicopters, but uh, in fact, you know, Black Hawk, Chinook, the Kiowas, you name it. They're all fighting in combat. They're all in harm's way. I distinctly remember the the Chinook that we lost um, flying all those special forces over Afghanistan three years ago, four. I, it was you know, sort of a record-breaking uh, loss. Um, in the war in Afghanistan up to up until that time. And so there's no doubt about it that that everybody who flies a helicopter in the US Army is a combat aviator. So I, I would question, you know, I would say it's not necessarily a perfect analogy in that case. I'd like to I like saying controversial things to get people thinking. Um, it's not clear to me that the Abrams Doctrine has been working the way that it was intended to in the past 13 years of war. Um, I understand the philosophy behind it and agree that community support for our conflicts is absolutely vital. So you'll get no argument from me there. Part of the issue of shifting to an all-volunteer force and the way we've constituted the all-volunteer force is that even with bringing in folks from the Guard and Reserve who are more tied to communities throughout America than the active component is, I still don't think that mechanism is working in quite the way that General Abrams intended, um, particularly given the low levels of public support for both of the wars we're coming out of. Now, you know, you don't know the counterfactual, right? If it had just been active component forces, would the pu public support have been even lower? And it's entirely possible that that's true. Um, but I, I think 
I think we're entering a time where so many things are changing at once. The budget environment is fundamentally changing. That's going to affect the Department of Defense for at least a decade and not beyond. I mean, at some point, defense spending will grow again, but I, you know, in the absence of some huge external event, I don't see that happening for the foreseeable future. We're coming out of two wars, which means we have huge decisions to make about resetting the force and, and the future direction and where the force is going. And we're also at a time, I think, of, of very abrupt strategic change. I think you don't get these inflection points very often. And so the, the confluence of those things makes me very wary of automatically taking any models from the past and saying we need to recreate them now. I think we need to examine them, look at the assumptions within them, see if they're working the same way that they did in the past. And in that spirit, I'm not sure the Abrams Doctrine is doing what it was intended to do. That then means if I'm right, or if we at least should have a discussion about that to figure out whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, that may take us in all sorts of different kinds of directions about what we want all of our forces, but particularly uh, reserve and guard forces to look like in the future to try to strengthen that connection, maybe in different ways than we've done it in the past in order to tap into the community support that I think we all view as so vital. <laughs> Let me just segue, if I may, as the moderator. Part of this question, the discussion is talking about the, the deployment times and, and and, and I haven't heard anything about lift capability, and it confuses me because lift was such a huge factor before, and it seems to have evaporated from the discussions. I, I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts on that as we think about this construct of what kind of forces we need. So the report has a couple of lines on lift. Um, and um, it is basically that lift is a problem not for the guard, not for active duty army. It's a problem for everybody. <laughs> Um, we, you know, meet with folks from Special Operations Command, they have a lift problem. I mean, literally, lift is, um, I would put it in the top five issues facing the department um, and that they're going to have to address in the next, next few years. Um, so from a lift perspective, I think once we figure out what appropriate missions, priorities, requirements are and whether, how we're going to use the Guard going forward, how we're going to use active duty forces going forward, and regardless of deployment, you know, lift is going to be a problem for everybody. And if, you know, if a National Guard unit gets tapped to go somewhere, um, they're going to have a lift problem just as regular Army is going to. I don't know if my colleagues have a different perspective. I, I would, uh, spending time with the Air Force, I think that, that it's just, right, it's a function of, even if we wanted the war plans to be slightly more adaptable or to, to handle contingencies where the enemy gets a vote or we're going to do something longer, et cetera, we're, con we're literally handcuffed by, by lift challenges. And, and this is where, you know, this is where uh, uh, the, when I think back to the 2010, you know, when the, when the budget, the defense budget peaked and things started to come back down and I remember a plus one in the tank of, to the chief telling me a story about, uh, you know, this <coughs> blood oath that took place at the time where, the chiefs all agreed that they wouldn't pull out the knives and, and go after each other's TOA and, and, and that, how that was true at the time. And, and, and today, you know, we're now in your budget year four of, of a, a significant build down and, and revised downward war plans. And this is where it's, it's time to see that pact resurrected, so to speak, because this is where the Army and the Navy need to become advocates for the U.S. Air Force and the capabilities that they provide because if, if the Air Force can't get you there, the Army will shrink even smaller. And isn't that a really scary outcome? Yeah, I think, uh, Kim, you've identified something that is hugely important. And, uh, you know, I'm not even sure it's top five. It may be top one or two uh, on the, the key issues of the future. T to tie it back to how it particularly affects Guard and Reserve units, um, as I said at the beginning, I see blame on both sides of this debate on active and, you know, the reserve component disagreements. Um, but I'm going to pick on the active army for a moment. You can get me to pick on the reserve component in a minute. Um, I've heard arguments from lots of folks in the active army about how, you know, the reason why you can't c contemplate blended units or the reason why we need to turn the, the garden reserve back into a strategic reserve that we plan on only, you know, to use in the worst contingencies. Um, is because they're not ready and we can't get them ready and they won't be able to deploy to the fight. Okay, but you can't get most army, active army units there either, right? You can't get 
you're, you know, even at lower levels of force structure, you can't get your combat units all to a fight within the first month or two anyway, even if their readiness levels are at the absolute highest levels, even if you've invested those dollars, because you don't have the lift, right? So you have to go to some sort of tiered deployments anyway, even just of your active forces. Now, that's probably not a good thing. I agree that we should be, the, the Army and the Navy should be huge advocates for the Air Force on lift on this. But given that that's a constraint and that lift is probably never going to be sufficient to meet the demand, the Army is, a total Army is always going to have to figure out how to sequence its force flow, which is where I come back to, I think, you know, lift being one of the reasons why it makes much more sense to me to start thinking about all of Army units in the total force based on time to deploy. Right? Because if I'm going to be waiting eight to nine months to flow in Army forces, does it make sense to have them all be active component? Can I take advantage of, new, as I said, new types of organization to create units that can't be ready on D-Day, got it, can't be ready in the first month or two, got it, but you know, I could be ready to flow in at month seven or nine or 12 or something like that. That's where you know, I think the lift constraint even gives more impetus to the need to think in new and creative ways about how we get Fort Army, total Army forces into the fight most effectively overall. If I could put a shout out for CRAF, this um, Civil Reserve Air Fleet, I think is, is uh, we just call it CRAF, right? Um, and, and reactivating sort of, of those those agreements and thinking about hard about how to use CRAF going forward. I mean, having been in the Pentagon in, in the lead up to OEF and OIF and talking about leasing Antonovs and, um, you know, what, what do we do with Ukrainian aircraft um, and who do we put on them? Um, who wants to be put on them at, the, at some point? Um, I think having a, a, a hard discussion, and this is outside, obviously, of the scope of, of our discussion today, but I just wanted to put out that I think um, part of the lift discussion really needs to take a hard look at CRAF going forward. Other questions? One and then two. Hi, and Nora, I wanted to say that you, I think you put your finger on, on, uh, on the, the crux of the argument and the significance of lift, because I, I, I saw it as almost the, the other shoe dropping when uh, the active components started denigrating in public the ability of the Guard to do mission, uh, the uh, uh, combat mission. And I think it was driven by that, because if you can't get all of your active brigades somewhere before the Guard units begin to come online and ready, then the argument has to be made, well, great Americans, they can drive trucks, but you know, they, they're just not up to that, that challenge. Now, my own brigade went to Iraq, uh, four months of post-deployment training, and got a meritorious unit citation for a combat mission, not fob protection or convoy protection, which is something you hear these days, which means it can be done. But I, as a guardsman, would not say every brigade would necessarily be able to do that. So I think, and again, you've put your finger on the question, how do you sequence? Now one answer could be, and you seem to be exploring mixes, and the other could be simply which units do you put out the gate first, and how do you, uh, how do you sequence the flow, both on the active side and the guard. And I'd like to note that, I like to say that the guard is a box, box of chocolates, but so is the active component. There are some units and leadership, uh, you know, brigade leaderships, division leaderships that are not as good as others. And so that may be one thing to take a look at, how you sequence the flow in. But the other thing, McKinsey, I, I have a problem with the rhetoric, the way that you were, uh, not rhetoric, that doesn't sound right, the, the, the logic you had about everybody having to give up something. Because I think you were importing a strangely political language into what should be a professional discussion. That is, it almost treats the active component and the reserve component as the two stakeholders with the public sitting, you know, in, in the, 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 um, the stands watching the game going on. Um, I think if you take an extreme example of horse cavalry, you know, you, you wouldn't say, well, tank community, horse cavalry, everybody gives up something because the missions have gone away for the horse cavalry. So I think it, it, it actually should be a professional discussion. And if the guard's able to do the mission, fine. If they can't, they shouldn't be doing it. They should have it taken away. And so I, that, that, a, a slight discomfort in the way you were approaching that issue. No? Okay. Uh, the lady here in the second row. Hello. I'm Margaret Cope. I have a, um, a background in the Air Force. I'm not going to talk about lift with General Schwartz. 
here, but um, anyway, I'm a national security consultant now. But my concern is a common lexicon, and I notice in the report you use active component, reserve component mix, but you don't include the Army Reserve, and that's huge. And they're Title 10, and um, um, I would like your thoughts with regard to that relative to this report. I know this report is on the Guard, but you have the reserve component that is Title 10 already. Um, and secondly, since cyber is not necessarily going to use lift, would it make sense to use the Army Reserve for cyber missions um, because they could immediately address any um, federal issue, um, whereas the Guard is uh, still state? Thank you. That's a great. Um Th that you notice that um, uh, truth in advertising. My husband is, a, is an army gar um, reservist, um, and uh, he asked me the same question when I asked him to take a look at the paper. Um, so, the army reserve is in an interesting spot in this discussion, um, and it's something that the congressman and I talked about before um, he entered uh, this room. Um, you know, when you talk about missions and you talk about um, you know combat and combat service support and combat support. Um, you know, the reservists are funded through the active duty army completely um, at all times. Um, and so it's an interesting spot that they're placed in. Um, and when in the report we were, I think I have maybe one line on, on why we don't really talk about the reserves. Um, one, one rationale is the focus of the report was the guard, the future of the guard. The second was is that any time I try to talk to reservists about this issue and, and couch it in, in terms of active and reserve component, um, they ask me to stop. And that, that I think the rationale behind that, and this is conjecture on my part, was, you know, one, they're not seeing the same scale of reductions as the other, um, as their, as their other folks, um, the active component and the, and the guard are seeing from a percentage perspective and strength numbers, um, and also, um, you know, what made it interesting is I, I was a staffer in Congress when um, the chief of the National Guard Bureau got a fourth star and was placed on the joint staff. There are people out there advocating that we that America did the same for the reserves, um, making the joint staff probably completely unwieldy, um, to be honest. Um, so. I, I come back, this is a long rambling answer to your question, which is we didn't talk about it because one, the, the reserve folks didn't really want to talk about it to the extent that the others did. And two, they are in a very unique position. Um, I hate saying very unique. It's a unique position um, that, um, that being funded by active duty folks, um, it, it's just, it's very, very hard to to tease them out on these topics. And it's not an excuse um, necessarily, it's just the, what we encountered in our report. If I might, uh, I think we have time for one more. Yeah. Sir. Uh, uh, excuse me, hi, I'm Walter Cole. I'm with the DHS Domestic Nuclear Detection Office. And I just wanted to look at uh, get your thoughts on finding number nine. You say the Army National Guard has the capacity to increase partnerships for domestic missions and serve as a supplemental force f for other departments and agencies. I, I hardly agree with that finding. And I, I wanted to see what your thoughts are of, of, of potentially using the National Guard in the prevent, protect role more the, than the response and consequence management. And, and you say in the, at the end, that uh, we don't want to think of the Guard as an easy alternative to finding long-term solutions. If you don't think that they could potentially be a long-term solution, what, what might be other long-term solutions you think would be appropriate? So some of our discussions really did focus on what the Guard can bring to the inner agency and not just to the Army or DOD. And so, you know, talking about what support they can provide to entities like DNDO um, or entities other, other entities within um, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Energy, um, particularly on this kind of detection prevention um, end of the spectrum. Um, of course, 
Th this also falls into, all right, so is it a federal mission? If so, under what authority? And with what reimbursement um, processes that are acceptable to all? <laughs> Which is a big um, thing to bite off, right? Um, the other is, you know, at what point does it become a state mission? Under what authority on all of that? Um, and so it, it's an interesting uh, question. We came to the resolution, the, the, well, the resolution we came to was that um, it, it needed further exploration to see who in the interagency was interested in having a guard component. Um, and a lot of that depended on the authorities and the funding. Um, but also moving forward, would the guard be a, a, a rational long-term solution? And in some cases it is because it builds on existing skill sets. Um, doesn't make them more expensive to train, you know, it, it, that kind of thing. And I think what your office does, sir, is is one of the one of the few that we talked about. They said absolutely. I think they could probably help on the prevent and the deter, um, just because they're in every state, um, and and the training that you guys you all get is something that I think they would benefit from. Um, others are less clear, right? I mean, you've got. Um, Customs and Border Protection, Border Patrol in particular, um, Office of Air and Marine, if you're looking at um, the Air National Guard, and others that it may not be the long-term solution. You may have to find a more systemic um, within DHS solution um, to address longer-term issues. And so we sort of didn't want to have a blanket statement that it would be useful equally for all other federal agencies and states, um, but we wanted to put it out there that Upon review, there there are some that are that could benefit from the guard more than others. I think it's a great question and good analysis by Stephanie. As long as it's on a case by case basis and it's a complementary capability that the guard provides to other federal agencies, not supplanting. And here I go back to Border Patrol in the southwestern United States. Uh, Customs and Border Patrol needs more agents, period. And it's, there are benefits for the Army National Guard in particular for helping, helping offset the lack of agents to perform that mission, training in particular. Uh, but as far as a long-term solution goes, they're not customs agents, okay? So, and, and Congress and DHS too often, I, this is from prior years, this is not today. This is something that was really um, peaking five years ago. Uh, it was just, wow, they've got more money, more manpower, let's just use them. And I know that's easy to think of because DOD is the elephant in the room, and I get that. Uh, so I, I would just caution it. Okay. Um, if I may, one, one, I'm going to try and put the panelists on the spot here on, on the, for the last question, if you don't mind. Uh, I doubt I can do it, but I'd like to try to open this question up of resolution of this problem. Um, the report endorses the idea of the commission, nor you say it's inevitable. I, I agree with you. I think it's a good idea and it's also inevitable. I'm not certain it's enough to solve the problem, nor you talked about new personalities. Mackenzie, you talked about um, a political solution. What, what more do we need here? I mean, if we really, if we're going to go through this fight, and it is an ugly one right now, it, how do we solve this or prevent this from occur recurring immediately? And, and is a place like the Council of Governors, a, uh, I mean, what's the mechanism, but is the, does the Council of Governors provide an avenue that could be helpful? I'll go first. I think you need three things. Um, one, and, and I talked about it, and Mackenzie talked about it, and actually Nora talked about it too, which is this total force task force to handle internal Army issues, um, and hopefully separate from personalities. I mean, I, I hope that people who they choose to staff would be as unbiased and fair as possible. Um, but of course, they each bring their own, um, each member would bring their own um, background and experience. Um, and that will help prevent having to go to the public discourse with blatantly um, obvious um, tensions and having a fight in public. Get your house in order um, and figure out what the real issues are. And I think the Total Force Task Force can help with that. Commonality or a common understanding of what um, the cost of, of, a, of an army, what cost of a soldier. I mean, and that is where we go back to in our report, Congressional Budget Office, take it out of the Pentagon, get somebody to look at it, get to figure out what exactly is the cost of a soldier, um, what's the cost active, you know, across the, across the components. Um, and the third thing, of course, I forgot, um, and so, oh, this was um, getting politicians to, to step up. Um, and and I know this is hard, I, and Mackenzie's absolutely right. I mean, 
when people refer to General Odierno's plan, he obviously had to get permission from his civilian oversight, right? Or permission, or at least um, acknowledgement and, and agreement to go forward. Um, and so having, you know, Secretary McHugh relatively silent, having Secretary Hagel, who I understand is active in the background, but not in a public space, not owning this issue um, is, is detrimental because it hurts <laughs> career professionals. Um, and I don't care if, if you're military or civilian, um, you know, civil servant career professional, but when you don't have the people who are tasked with conducting oversight and taking responsibility for the tough decisions, abrogating their authority to do so, it's really, really harmful. And again, having politicians talk to politicians, so, so those would be my three, total force task force, common budget, uh, common cost numbers, and then actually asking the politicians to step up and own some of the decisions that are being made. I, I completely endorse all of those three things. I, I want to highlight two additional things. Well, actually, I think the first plays on the, the first. You need senior level leadership on this. This needs to be, I think, one of the highest priorities of the new chief of staff of the Army coming in, is to set a tone that we are going to, you know, we are family, we are going to solve this internally, and we are going to do what's right for the Army as a whole, but more importantly, the nation as a whole rather than being seen as, you know, more aligned with the active component or reserve component or whatever it is. That has, I think that has, you know, of all the challenges, and there are a lot, that the new Sec chief of staff of the Army is going to face. That, to me, is the single most important thing that he can do to help the health of the Army going forward. Um, the second thing, you know, I said before that I was, I, I see blame on both sides. I picked on, the, you know, one problem of the active component uh, before. Now I'm going to uh, pick on part of the, the, not the reserve component itself. Um, I think that there's been uh, a lot of politicking going on on what shouldn't be quite as much of a political issue as it is. And so my answer to, you know, is the Council of Governors a good place to explore this? My answer is absolutely not. Right? You, you want to take the, the politicians out of this. You want to create a situation where you don't have 54 tags signing a letter to Congress in an overt political play to do this. I, I'm not impugning motives, but it, it has to be taken out of that context. Frankly, I find some of the lobbying efforts that have been made by some of the Guard, uh, in particular organizations, but organizations that favor the reserve component, to be actively unhelpful in this. And I think that needs to be reined in. Um, so now I've given you equal time to, you know, something to pick on on both sides, which hopefully means that I'm coming down, you know, somewhere objectively in the middle. Um, but I think that you know it, you need leadership inside the service, and you need to take these decisions as far out of the political s debate, uh, overt political debate, as possible. It is never going to be possible to solve this on technocratic issues, right? I mean, there's always politics in it, but we need to get it out of the overt political arena and back to a discussion about what military capabilities the United States needs and what's best for the nation. It's a great concluding question, Kim. Uh, and I want to, to do what Nora says, of course, of course. But uh, I, I guess I've spent too many time, too much time with policymakers over the years, and there's just many traits about them. They're pretty much all the same, whether they're in the executive branch and they're political appointees, or whether they're in on Capitol Hill. And I, I, unfortunately, I don't think you can divorce the politics of this uh, or take it out. The, you know, we already talked about things like jobs and income and. You know, what impact on states that have nothing to do with, you know, can you support XYZ mission, flood relief, wildfires, et cetera. Um, so I actually think all the stakeholders have to be engaged. It's a little impractical, but at this point, what is there to lose, I, I guess you could say. So that would include, you know, a, a venue for the appropriate people reaching out to the governors. It, it includes the the outside groups and organizations, you know, I sort of, we broadly sort of we know them as sort of VSOs, but obviously that's not a good analogy here, and sort of the, the Guard Bureau and others, and Nagas, et cetera, all of the service associations, AFA, Navy League, et cetera, you know them all very well. There's a lot of them. And, and people like us, we're all outsiders, you know, trying to impact the, in, the, the debate um, and the outcomes. Uh, and I, I think there has to be this notion of uh, change, it's a coming. It's barreling down the track. So either come into the conversation, all of you, and be productive contributors to ideas and solutions, or have it imposed on you. And nobody ever really wants that, right? So anybody who's rational is gonna say, well, we wanna be part of the conversation. And, and think tanks like CS, CSIS are gonna be there to support you and, and provide you the analytics behind uh, those innovative solutions. And so I, I really believe these sort of broad 
big group hugs are important to get to the answer in the future. And I know it's a lot of work. I know it's a lot of you know shoe leather and pounding the pavement, but it's actually it's a way to get results enterprise wide. And that's really what's missing here is because only each solution only helps certain stakeholders and it's hard to get at this sort of larger solution where the sum is greater than the parts and it actually is good for national security, something that everybody, again, truly wants or at least should. So, um, and there are other sets of stakeholders, but those were just two that came to mind. Okay. This by thanking Stephanie for turning on my microphone first, but secondly, thanking you all for coming. Uh, we appreciate your being here to participate in this dialogue. And I'd like to ask you to thank the panel members, first Stephanie for the report and her team for putting this great, great report which has started the ball rolling and for our panel members who've done a terrific job on a, a tough issue and I think laid some ground for some useful steps forward. So please help me thank the panel members. <laughs>